Right, and what I'm going to do is just give you a, a quick introduction of how this uh, generally works for those that haven't been here before. So we've been working through various uh, chapters of our basic text, um, and tonight we're doing recovery and relapse. Uh, Frankie and I were looking through it. We're doing pages 83 and 84, which are absolutely amazing. The stuff in there is incredible. What we're doing is we're using the line numbered basic text which uh, I'll show you in a second. It's exactly the same as the sixth edition basic text, except every uh, sentence, every line has been assigned a number um, and it's uh, incredibly useful for study and study purposes. Um, what else do I need to say? Frankie's facilitating it as usual. We do this once a month and I'm going to hand it over to Frankie in a minute. It might be a little bit of an introduction, but what, what the way this works is we'll read a little bit of the text um, and then the, the way this works is it's very interactive. We really want people to put their hands up and share their experience. Frankie will ask a question or I'll ask a question based on the text and then it's not like a normal meeting where it's like four minutes share back time. We find that this really works well if everyone just takes a minute or two to share their experience because the, the success of this is based on us keeping moving and getting as much experience on this as possible. So just bear that in mind. I don't really want to be using a timer or tell, shutting people down, but just everyone just share back for a couple of minutes. That would be great. Um, have I forgotten anything, Frankie? Uh, no, not as far as I know, Paul. Uh, so far, I think a lot of the people who have attended this week have been to previous workshops. So the uh, link that I put in the chat is a fifth edition. It's the only one I could find. There seems to be a lot of people trying to monetize the basic text at the moment, but it's the same uh, pages. It will be the same part of... But I'm going to screen share it, Frankie. I'm going to screen share it. Yeah, just in case somebody wants to download it on their oh, phone. Oh, download it. Yeah, yeah. Or something. Or... Okay. Yeah. So it's so, just if anyone wants to follow it, I know you're going to screen share it. So uh, the way Paul and I were discussing this today was basically we're going to go in paragraphs and then we're going to have a few questions that we'll create during the paragraphs and then. We want experience shared. Some will be experience from using, and other experience will be uh, how recovery works. So nobody's excluded. We, we want to know because everything helps everyone, all, all our experience. The person who generally gets the most out of these workshops are the ones who don't talk, and that's weird. But I've been doing them for over a decade, and that's what seems to happen in the feedback that we get later on. So that's not to put anyone off, though. Feel free to shoot from the hip. So, Paul, do you want to start? I'm, I'll Frankie. Start. I'm an addict, by the way. Thank you. Hi, Frankie. So if I just share a page, so this is recovery and relapse. And let me see if I put this here. Can every that's page 83. And you can see what I mean with every line being assigned uh, a number. Um, so what we want, I think, Frankie, is someone to read um maybe this the first three paragraphs would that work uh let's do a paragraph at a time paul with a couple okay. of questions let's not let's, overload it okay Rene, we're just going to unmute you if you could read the first those those lines that are highlighted please yeah sure my name's Rene, and i'm an addict Hi, Rene. uh the progression of recovery is the continuous uphill journey um Without effort, we start the downhill run again. The progression of the disease is an ongoing process, even during abstinence. Thank you. Thanks, Rene. Thanks, Rene. Well, good to see you, mate. Uh, yeah, likewise. On the progression of recovery, being a continuous uphill journey, and without effort, we start the downhill run again. I have experience on that because I've been in treatment, come out of treatment, got a sponsor, gone to meetings, and then it's been like done step one, did step two, did step three, and then did fuck all for three months. And where I should have been doing a step four and doing some writing, I was just going to meetings and then going to parties afterwards, and I picked up. And that's my understanding of it. 
because it's an uphill journey. It's an effort to do pen to paper and do writing and praying when you don't believe and phoning other addicts and going to meetings and looking good to present well. But the minute I stop doing the service or being lapsed with my service or started putting the pen down, not picking it up, I started to roll backwards again. Can we have two or three people sharing any experience? You don't have to be relapsers, just anyone who's uh, noticed their recovery's got bad because they've stopped going through the process because it's a process recovery. Yeah, fantastic. Michael, if you want to answer the, the question, I think is this, uh, this progression of the disease is an ongoing process even during abstinence. So if we're not keeping up the effort, I'd like, love to hear what happened for what your experience was. Thank you. My name is Michael. I'm an addict. Um, <clears throat> thanks, everybody, for this workshop. I guess um, for me, I've been in recovery for a, a long time. And um, cut, about three or four years ago, I stopped going to meetings regularly. Um, I would attend one every now and again. And I stopped sharing with other addicts. Um, I didn't relapse on drugs and alcohol. But what I noticed is um, I became less able to deal with the challenges of my life in a healthy and recovery oriented way. I let go of the things that I'd learned in recovery and I put on weight. I became unhappy and unable to, unable to just self care, you know, all that self care stuff, it all just slipped away. And, um, and it wasn't until an event happened in my life and it, it brought about a more rigorous application of the program that I realized um, what the answer is for me. And it's what the answer has always been for me. It's engaging in the process of recovery. It's going to meetings, it's sharing with people. And it's, um, you know, it's that thing about self-discipline, isn't it? Like, which I've learned, it's embarrassing to have learned self-discipline after almost 20 years in recovery. You know, it's an uphill process and it's the same with everything in my life. You know, um, meetings, 12-step recovery, looking after myself, treating myself well, becoming healthy. All of that stuff requires self-discipline. And I guess the um, fellowship word for self-discipline is manageability. And I think that's what happened for me is I stopped engaging in the process of recovery and the unmanageability returned to my life. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Michael. Beautiful. Um, I think it's Renee next. A couple of minutes, Renee. Yeah, sure. It won't be long. Um, just have a look at that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, what I just read. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for me, yeah, a, a continuous uphill journey. It makes it sound really hard, and it going uphill, especially in this weather. But um, without effort now. You know, I just want to make it clear, I haven't relapsed, you know what I mean? But I've had, you know, I mean, I think I have a spiritual relapse possibly every single day. But um, just over three years ago, I was like in intensive care. I wasn't in an hospital, but spiritually, mentally and emotionally is where I was, punching myself in the head. And I weren't particularly well, I suppose. Um, and my sponsor did say to me at the time, he said, uh, he said, Rennie, you're, you know, Oh, oh, yeah. He said, Rennie, you're fucked, you know, he said, but you're doing all the right things. So that's one good thing that I learned here. So I was able to follow the suggestions and, uh, but the progression of disease, and I'm going, yeah, I thought it was suicidal. You know, I was self-rejecting sort of physically, you know, um, I felt homicidal and I was in, uh, I was out of shape. And um, since then I've been through the, another set, the steps through the green and gold and, uh, yeah, my recovery exists in the moment, you know what I mean? You might catch me on a good moment or a bad moment, but yeah, it's um, it's vital that, that I engage with this process and uh, that includes sending meetings and, you know, following the suggestions, you know, regular meetings and uh, regular inventory. I'm still doing step tens and yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I, sometimes I feel really kind of mental, you know, like my internal terrorist will do a little number on me and it's, you know, the disease. And, uh, but I, I, I suspect that without it, I'll be proper, proper messed up, you know. Anyway, thanks for letting me share. Thank you.
Thanks, Renee. Great to hear you. And then we'll go Jericho Boys and then James, and then we'll we'll move on with the next section. Uh, okay, just getting you unmuted, Martin. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. I'm Mark. I'm an addict. Uh, thanks for taking the meeting, Paul. Thanks, Frankie. Um, uh, my experience is relapse also, mate. Um, for me, my experience is I got to three years, three years clean time, and I thought for me, I had cracked it. I didn't need, I didn't need to do anything any, anymore. Do you know what I mean? I had been through the 12 steps. I had a sponsor and I was a, a, a regular, regular meet attender. And what happened was I got complacent in my recovery. I put everything else before my recovery, girlfriend, all the outside stuff. And sadly for me, I was doing like three, four meetings a week. Then I was, I was, I was hooking up with like-minded people. I stopped body meetings. I stopped talking. I was being dishonest. And then inevitable happened, mate. Um, I relapsed. And it's now... I was out, there, out the door for two years there. And it's only took me... It took, I think I'm 18 days clean again. So I'm just back. At, I've had to be took out of society again to get clean. I couldn't get clean through the room. So for me, if you're not doing this stuff... And my experience is if you're not doing it, you fall all very quickly. It's only a daily reprieve, as I say, do you know what I mean? And it's like you're not putting the footwork in the action as I become sick very quickly. Um, and that's what happened to me, sadly. So it's got I've been given another chance by the grace of God, and I'm grateful for the treatment centre take me back in, and I've got another chance again, man. So clean time means nothing. Your knowledge means nothing in here. You're not putting the action and the footwork in. Um, yeah, you get fun out very quickly in these, in these places. So for me, I'm just glad to be here again. I'm glad to be sober and clean, thanks. Yeah. Well said, Martin. Thank you for sharing, James. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for this. And, uh, the other guys running it. Uh, it says uphill, downhill. I, could, I like the way someone else explained it to me, like a uh, level, topping it up. You know, <clears throat> letting it go, and uh, the level goes down, and the behaviours are off the chart. Road rage, confrontational at work. Uh, Daughter's getting on my nerve, uh, you know, that type of thing, you know, being able to deal with certain situations. Whereas if I, you know, regular meetings, putting pen to paper, um, it just it just seems to, uh, I seem to be getting bet better at dealing with uh, whatever comes my way. Uh, sometimes things can, most of the time, things can bounce off me if, um, if I'm a bit nuts and been away from it and the levels are down. I can, uh, you know, be a bit sensitive and fly off the wall, <laughs> fly off the handle at any remark and stuff. But uh, uh, yeah, I always have a better day if I do the suggestions and, uh, and keep it up. Um, I have experience of... Uh, of relapse, and it was what well, it was always well in the post before it even happened. When I look back in the cycle of it, it was a good uh, it was a good month or two of uh, slowly that level going down, and then I had no defence. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Cheers, Paul. Thanks, James. <clears throat> good to hear you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh... If we go move on from uh, line one four two yeah. down to one fifty, those little marks there—they was the first time I'd learned when I came to an A that they're the grammar marks for a paragraph because I didn't know what they were before I got here. I've had even a bit of a uh, education from that from an A. One of the things I was going to ask is—is is, is Joe going to be a? Uh, Reader, dictionary person this week. Oh yeah, Joe, Joe, Joanne. Feel free if there's anything there that jumps out. Dig well, it. Dig I want to ask Joanne to look at intimate as we start into this, because it says it places us in an intimate, regular contact with people just to see what the dictionary says intimate means. It looks to me, being dyslexic, it looks like intimate, which sounds a bit. Uh, I don't know. I can't say it. Can't say it without sounding rude, but would somebody like to read the paragraph? Can we have a hand up? Can, can I just give you a fun factoid as well that the dictionary is the only outside piece of literature that is endorsed by any literature, <laughs> anything else? Um, right, okay, who, who wants to do a bit of uh, who wants to do a bit of reading? Hand up, Margaret, perfect, fantastic, thank you, Paul. Margaret, do you want me to do the numbers as well? Or just yeah, yeah please do the numbers, that would be great. Okay, 142, 
we came here, we come here powerless. And the power that we comes to other people in Narcotics Anonymous, but we must reach out for it. 143, now clean and in the fellowship, we need to keep ourselves surrounded by others who know us well. 144, we need each other. 145, Narcotics Anonymous is a fellowship of survival and one of its advantages is that it places us in intimate, regular contact with the very people who can best understand and help us in our recovery. 146, good ideas and good intentions do not help if we fail to put them into action. 147, reaching out is the beginning of the struggle that will set us free. 148, it will break down the walls that imprison us. 149, a symptom of our disease is alienation and honest sharing will free us to recover. 150, we are grateful that we were made so welcome at meetings that we felt comfortable. Thanks for letting me read. Thanks, thanks, Margaret. Frankie, can I just can I just make a point of observation? It's just a cool. bit nerdy, but I just notice in the basic text, like the phrase open the door gets used a lot. And I've just noticed something. This is why I like studying it. This because the the what jumped out to me was we must reach out for it. Where was it? Oh, there in 142. And then again, it's used 147, reaching out. It's just these, the, there's a bit of repetition with some of the language that's used, which I think is interesting, but maybe I'm being a bit nerdy. Well, you find that with professional sharers or people who run workshops or people who's trained with it like myself, what happens is you start off generally with an icebreaker, something to make someone laugh or smile. You also have the pregnant pause because everyone wonders why it's gone quiet. And then the other thing is you repeat what you say. And if you can do it on a minute basis, it has the chance for people to retain it because as they're thinking what's been said, it comes back again. So it's very cleverly written, the book, yeah. because it will keep repeating. It's well spotted with that. But that's really well spotted. Uh, if we could pick on as we come down with that thing of, uh, well, let's go on that one. We say what you say, where we must reach out for it. Can people, can we have three people, two minutes each, giving examples of how they've reached out for support or how they've gone to different meetings or whatever? Sally, let's get you unmuted. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Frankie. Thanks for uh, the workshop. Um, it's, uh, so, yeah, just talk about reaching out. Um, I relapsed the last time because I wasn't working my recovery. And um, I, if I'm not working um, my recovery, I'm working the relapse. For me, it's one or the other. I get so extreme to, to either ends, and I just sort of became very emotionally overwhelmed and couldn't deal with all sorts of issues that were coming my way. The problem with that was, is I didn't have a little support network around me. I didn't have anybody I could reach out to. So when I look back, what I've learned this time round, and I'm 52 days back from a relapse, and the past 52 days has been a real, I've put in so much action uh, because I want to, do you know what I mean? And also I, I just feel the benefits from it so much quicker. Um, and what I've done is basically um, I felt the need to connect with women in recovery because I just did not do that last time, you know, and I a, was hiding from that. Um, and I can justify that because I could say, oh, I was doing service, I was doing meetings and everybody else has so much, you know, men in recovery have just as much, you know, um, useful and, 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 you know, and great, you know, recovery and blah, blah, and all that. So I could justify that. Um, but I wasn't speaking to anybody on a daily basis at all, um, even by text, because I was just too scared to pick up the phone. So um, I'm still scared to do it. I'm still anxious. But my, you know, disease, I suppose, my disease comes out in those ways. And I isolate myself because I'm comfortable. I, I, can, I can just retract from what I know is really good for me. And the problem is if I start doing that, um, very quickly it becomes really hard uh, like that uphill journey that uphill climb you know I found that hard to start that again because I think once you're running uphill you get used to it um, but just end on this because I know it needs to be really short um, uh, I reached out and I asked a couple of women to be my sponsor and, and, and finally somebody said yes um, I didn't take it personally um, I speak to somebody at least every day if not every other day because I do work and it can get busy 
Uh, my sponsor between her and her new husband has nine children as well. So I have to appreciate that. I've only got one. Um, the texting, I've come on this meeting. Um, I've just spread myself out and not just uh, secluded myself to just to where I live, but I don't really, and it's okay to not have um, anything in connection with the people around me. Because I thought I had to, because I was in NA, I had the expectation, just get on with it type thing. It doesn't matter if you like them, they like you, blah, blah, blah. And I could think too much into that. But yeah, so truly, it literally is, there's so much I've put into action. Um, and it feels more like I'm, you know, slowly walking, you know, on a very flat line at the moment, rather than uphill, because I'm reaching out and I'm finding it easier. Thank you. Nice one, Sally. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to bring in Joe. We'll bring in Barry and then get Joe. Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Paul, uh, and Joanne, Frankie, uh, for the meeting. Um, so, on reflections of reaching out, I'm 60s clean now. Sorry, I'm Barry, and I, I'm an addict, but I'm 60s clean now, and this is my fourth meeting. I've tried to kind of immerse myself within it this weekend, um, having reached out to people or various services over over a couple or a few years, um, but I really sort of not quite understood, I think, until this time and trying to ride this wave of motivation that I have at the moment. Not really understood that I was reaching out in the past, kind of not for me, the sort of, you know, situational or environmental or relationship-based reasons for doing so. Um, but uh, in reaching out to somebody I knew had been successful in the programme, it's actually, I don't know the etiquette, it was actually Paul, um, who's running the meeting, I'm very grateful for, um, reached out last year and got a lot of good advice. But didn't take it on and forward because I actually just realised that in myself that I wasn't ready to actually do so. You know, had the thought of feeling hungover on a on a morning that I need to reach out and do something, but actually not that understanding that I wasn't doing it for me, which feels a, a bit different this time. And I'm grateful to have been starting to read the basic text and coming to meetings and you know sort of trying to immerse myself in it. That actually, you know, that uniqueness and loneliness that you feel in reaching out to start with very quickly you know i've realized that you know not alone within it so that's just some of my reflections on that idea of reaching out thank you barry it's lovely to hear you share and um hopefully we'll get a chance to hear you later again and joel i'm just on mute sorry matt i just unmuted joel there are you there joel yeah cheers thanks paul uh I like that bit because it's Amazon the exact same. I have to reach out on um, a daily basis because I used to go to live meetings and that quite a lot, you know, and I was trying to reach out there, but I weren't getting the satisfaction or the experience what I needed by, you know, because they was talking about the war stories and all that, which it's for me, it's I need to, uh, I reach out on a daily basis it's for people's. Uh, out there struggling during the day, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm trying to get the aspects out because if I don't reach out on a daily basis, that means I'm getting my self-will back and my self-will is it's not a good thing for me at the moment, you know, because it's I try to take everything back to my life by not reaching out to or going doing volunteering, not asking the lads to take me out, go out with the lads and ask them for help and, you know, it's all, that's what I got off that anyway. Cheers. Thank you, Joe. Lovely to hear you. Um, How did you get on, Joe? Hi, I'm Joe. I'm an addict. So the definition of intimate is intimacy is closeness between people and personal relationships. It's what builds over time as you connect with someone, grow to care about each other, and feel more and more comfortable during your time together. Wow. So that's a process in a process, then, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think. Would you mind looking at alienation? Because yeah. alienation's like alien nation, isn't it? <laughs> My dyslexia's running wild. But... Yeah, plus you're a sci-fi geek. Yeah, yeah. How are we doing, Joe? All right. Um, to cause to be estranged, to make unfriendly, hostile, or indifferent, especially if where attachment formerly existed. Wow. So a symptom of the uh, disease is to feel separate and not part of. That's what I'll get from that. I don't know if anyone else gets that. Yeah. And honest sharing will free us to recover. So try not to make it up as you go along. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. 
Paul, go on. What's the next question? You had a couple of questions for us, Paul, didn't you? Well, did I on this stuff? Hang on, one, four, six. Putting it into action was I really love to hear. Well, people have been talking about what put, was that the last question? What putting it into action looks like for people? Is that what we just asked? Yeah. Right, one, five, two. Well, mine was on the next section, but if I just look at the text, reaching out is the beginning of the struggle. So, Margaret, maybe I think you're next, or it's Ryan, but. Maybe reaching out is the beginning of the struggle. So reaching out is a struggle. I mean, I had it today with, I hadn't spoken to my sponsor and he's been busy, I've been busy, I hadn't spoken to him for a week. Knew he was free at nine o'clock this morning, thought, well, I won't, I, you know, it's just like, but, you know, just having to push through that, um, that isolation, I suppose, that you've just talked about it and that kind of negativity to, to do it. Is reaching out has reaching out been a struggle for you, Margaret? Maybe get you on that. Um, yes, I'm Margaret, I'm an addict. Um, hey, yes, it definitely was. It was really difficult to to contact people, but also there was another form of it that I hadn't quite realised. I was really, really struggling with people's meetings that had experience, strength, and hope formats. Um, it was just, it was irritating me and I was struggling with identification and it was making it worse and it gradually got worse and worse and worse until I realised it was causing an obstruction and it was pretty much making me dread coming to meetings. Um, and then I think what actually changed was, was this workshop. I think when I first came onto one of these workshops and I realised how different that was and how much I could relate much more to that. But the problem was I didn't realise that you could search for different formats and meetings on the website. So I just carried on getting more and more irritated until one day I'd had enough. I had a, there was a very loud preachy American in one of the meetings I was on. And um, I thought, oh, my God, I can't stand this any longer. And then I felt so guilty. I left the meeting. I felt so guilty that I went and looked for another one. And it turned out to be one that was on daily, which had different formats. Um, and from there was a basic text, there was living clean, there was um, spiritual, there was all sorts. And um, I resonated with that so much more. So then I realized that that was what I had to do, even though it was daunting to leave the meetings I'd already been going to, because I obviously got to know people in these meetings. I realised if you're going to get anywhere with this, you're going to have to look for other meetings like that because that's your next step. And I don't think I actually realised it at the time, but once I started doing that, things got easier and I could relate much more. Um, so that was one form of reaching out that I felt I had to do for my recovery. I'll leave it there. That's great, Margaret. Thanks very much. I love that idea that everything's up for revision and we have choices And here. If there's anyone new, there's lots of different formats. I mean, I find myself going to meetings that I still can't stand, but I like to hurt myself. You know, I like to, I don't play nice in the NA playground and I forget to abstain, you know, the process, abstain from, from that meeting and find another meeting because like you had fallen into a I think I've been coming to this meeting for two years, but I don't like it, but I still do. Well, I didn't like using either, but I still kept doing it, you know. So um, thank you for that, Margaret. That's great. And Ryan, do you want to come in on either taking action or anything you've heard? Yeah, hello. I'm Ryan, a grateful recovering addict. Thank you, everyone, on this meeting. Yeah, reaching out is uh, very important. Um, you know, I did a lot of reaching out when I first, when I first came to NA. Um, you know, I was uh, really suffering, actually. I, I still am a bit, you know. Um, I'm nine months and two weeks and four days clean. Um, and I've nearly finished my step four. Um, I find I did reach out a lot when I then WhatsApp groups. Um, and I find I get I got knocked back a lot because, um, you know, I was carrying a lot of a lot of weight and uh, you know, I got a lot of problems with my kids and my ex. Um, so it's it's a it's a very difficult journey. I think the more the more the more uh, the more we carry with us, um, it's it's difficult because you know I wanted answers. You know, when I first came in, I wanted I suppose I wanted a quick fix. <laughs> you know, um, but there isn't one, is there? Um, you know, now I'm a lot wiser. Um, you know, I think it's very important when we do reach out to each other, not to, you know, I do, I, do, I don't mind people giving me advice in that, but, 
you know, I'm not necessarily going to take it because, um, you know, I've got to do what's right for me and my recovery. It might not be, it might not sound right to someone else's. Um, you know, to, uh, just a minute ago, I was, you know, when I first come on the meeting, I was pumping up my bike tires because I got to ride over to my ex-partner's tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. I got to leave there at seven. Well, yeah, at seven o'clock. Um, to then bring him back on the bus. I got three. I got three of three of them. One of them's been suspended from school. Um, my eldest has been suspended from school. Um, you know, my ex-partner, her life's getting totally unmanageable. She, she's in sort of denial of it all. You know, and there ain't anybody there for, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm their support, you know, um, you know, surface. Ryan, what are you, what are you doing to get the support? Because you sound like you, you're the one that needs the, the, one, support. the support. Well, I mean, there's not a lot that anyone can do for me, really. I mean, there's not a magic wand, is there? I mean, I'm the only person that can sort this, my, my amends out. No one else can come in and sort my amends out, but me. You can you know what I'm saying? I've, I've, you know, I've caused this damage, and I'm the only one who can who can fix it. You know, social services is on standby. You know, and I've got to be there on standby to, to you know, for because I can't control what's happening. You know, it's already done. The damage is done. Oh, that's so, so, okay, cool, Ryan. That's that's two minutes. That's absolutely. But I, I, that, I was getting from that the idea of service being a an as a, a being an action, taking action through through a living amends. Um, are you, are you, thanks, yeah. thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Can we get, can we get someone to read uh, from one fifty to the end of one five two, the next paragraph? There you go. Or well, I'll read it here. Look, I'll read it. We're grateful that we were made so welcome at meetings that we felt comfortable. I don't know. Is that true? Let us know. Without staying clean and coming to those meetings, we would surely have a rougher time with the steps. Any use of drugs will interrupt this process. That's the main question, but we'll save that for the second one so people can think about it. The second question is going to be any use of drugs will interrupt the process of recovery but the first question will be uh leading on from what margaret said was uh we are grateful that we're made so welcome at meetings and that we felt comfortable is this true because my first few meetings i didn't <laughs> okay renee do you want to come in yeah sure i'm running i'm an addict to an addict so uh, first meeting i went to <clears throat> Uh, after phoning the helpline in 2003 was uh, Blackheath Wednesday night. Little plug there, but and I still go to that meeting. Um, it's been resurrected. But uh, there was a couple of guys there who I'd used with and, uh, and, and scored off, you know, and they was pleased to see me, you know. And, and, and it went from there. At the end of the meeting, I asked some guy, how clean are you? And he said he's nine and a half years, you know, all I wanted was help, you know what I mean? I didn't even know I wanted a day clean, but that come a few weeks later, I thought, wow, yeah, that's what I wanted, is a day clean. But uh, the guy there, he gave me a where to find, and he wrote on the back, pick up the phone, not the drugs. A useful bit of information, you know what I mean? I didn't know I was going to make a call, but because all the money I, I had was going in another direction, you know, phone boxes, 20 pence calls or whatever. And um, so... Um, but one thing I did was, uh, or what he did, he said, well, it is a where to find and there's this meeting. So the next day I went to Mile End. It was just, we sat at Simon's uh, Thursday night meeting, I think, um, psychiatric hospital. And this guy was there at the end of that meeting. The same guy who was at Blackheath took me over to the pool table and bought me a fifth edition basic text. Um, and he gave me a lift home. And uh, down there, I was living in Plumstead at the time, so through the Blackwall Tunnel. And then, took me to a, a restaurant. Um, yeah, we had a curry. He bought he bought a lot, you know, he made me, you know, and he was like that, you know, he was like that a lot. And then I went to other meetings, Denby Road. Uh, I was going up Portobello Road. I found I've got a sponsor up there, you know, and I was I was still my methadone, and, but I was made to feel welcome, you know what I mean? And uh, going out for food after these meetings was one of the things they seemed to do quite a lot then, you know, uh, so... It certainly helps, you know, some acceptance. And a lot of my behaviours was unacceptable, 
you know, I was a thief, a liar, a cheat, and all I wanted was, uh, God, all I wanted was a day clean, and uh, I was encouraged, and that was my experience, you know, but I guess I was lucky. I looked odd. I had a broken neck, you know, looked a bit like Frankenstein, but, you know, there we are. It seemed to help. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Uh, James, two minutes. Oh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, the first couple of meetings, some of them were a bit clicky. I just thought, walty wall wankers. And looking back, I was probably the biggest wanker, you know what I mean? Uh, Renny was talking about that uh, mile end meeting. I loved that, full of cockroaches, but right front, front line. Uh, I think if you just get through all those uncomfortable feelings and just keep coming back, as they say, I hated that as well, you know what I mean? Then those wankers start showing, you spend enough time around people, the, you find some good in people, you know what I mean? You end up, you know, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, so to speak. You just end up building relationships and getting intimate. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thanks, brilliant. Uh, Joe, do you want to come in? Thanks, Paul. Um, do you know, I've certainly always been made welcome in live meetings um, and on Zoom. Um, but that word comfortable, I don't think that's ever <laughs> I don't think that's ever been the case for me. And I looked it up, the definition of comfortable is mind and body being at ease or someone that makes a person feel secure, happy, or relaxed. I know when I'm in a meeting, my mind's never at ease. Um, my body rarely is at ease. You know, I'm very anxious and you know, I went to a meeting outside my area the day um, and that level of anxiety went up about five notches because I can get very comfortable in my own area, you know, with the people that go about. And I was thinking maybe it's a good thing to do that, you know, just keep that anxiety at the forefront and just keep practising, pushing through it because that's what I need to do all the time. You know, a wee bit of courage just to keep, whether it's reading a card or going to a meeting, whatever it is, the anxiety is always there and I always need to push through it. But I kind of laughed when I heard that word comfortable because, no, I'm never comfortable. Never. I'm an addict. And no, never. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, Joe. That uh, come in. You hear sometimes in meetings when people say it's they're at this ease. It's this ease, you know, because it is that thing of it. When, if you don't feel comfortable in a meeting and you're not able to focus and you're distracted, like someone's turning the kettle on and off or they're really erratic on fucking Zooms, getting up and getting down and all the rest of it. You can, I can feel at this ease because I'm, I'm a cat with a laser pen, me. You know? Paul? Thanks. Thanks, Frankie. I was going to bring in the, uh, the Jericho girls because um, we haven't heard from those guys. And I think we need to get a, some kind of jingle made up for Joe's Dictionary Corner thing. Every time she reaches for the dictionary, we'll get the jingle <laughs> out. Um, OK. Hey, how are you doing, Moira? Hi, Paul. Good to see you. Uh, I am Mo Moira. I'm an addict. I feel uncomfortable in meetings at um, or in the fellowship. I was in another fellowship. I was in and out of it for a long time, 12, 13 years. And although I went, I went to get sober and I never... I didn't ever feel like I fitted in, and I'm quite I'm quite new to Narcotics Anonymous. I started coming about Narcotics Anonymous in about October, November time, and the first group that I went to, I, I then joined, and it became my home group. And genuinely, um, when I went there, I felt as if I was home. You know, I physically relaxed. The anxiety left me. Um, there was a lot of love. Um, there was a lot of friendships. There was a lot of laughs. I always carried a serious message stuck to the format, the readings and stuff. And but oh, it was just it's the only other time I've ever really experienced the power within the rooms, and and, and that was coming to NA through my home group. Um, so I that's me. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you, Moira. I really love this idea about the atmosphere of recovery. You know, step 12 was a game changer for me when I thought, you know, when I realized that I had a responsibility. To, to help create the like we all do an atmosphere of recovery. It talks about it in step 12, mutual respect, where we don't look down on anyone. What you're gonna judge me after the shit you've done, you know, it's and and that unconditional love, you know, but we're, you know, we're addicts, we're like animals, we can sense things, the unseen sometimes, and uh 
sometimes it's just us and sometimes I think it's the, the meeting. Ryan, do you want to cut, you just spoken, do you want to come in really quickly on this one and then we'll move on to the second question? You're, you're still muted, matey. Yeah, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I always feel I'm welcome. You know, I'm up to disease. The disease wants to be out the door. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, us addicts, we all look at, we look at the differences, don't we? It's, but we try to look at the similarities as well. And uh, resentments, they reflect. And, um, you know, I do feel, I, I do feel, um, under pressure I'm, I'm i'm already under a lot of pressure and i bring that i suppose i bring a lot of shit in with me and i share it out um and some people don't want to hear it but i mean that's what we do isn't it we, we share open honestly open-mindedly and willing to do that and, and all the other spiritual principles you know we got to it's all about empathy isn't it and um you know i just keep turning it over and reminding myself do you know what i mean this it's a battle, a constant battle um, of the mind. Um, so, I'm, but I'm getting stronger. I'm getting stronger, and you know, I I I know that things I say is painful to hear some of it, but um, truth is, is painful, and that's the only way we we you know that's that's the only way we get better is to speak the truth, isn't it? And um, but yeah, being Thanks. welcome, yeah. I, I, I do feel welcome and I don't feel welcome. <laughs> but I don't get enough time either, so uh, that's, that's all right though. Well, I mean, Let's it's get. a workshop, so we're just doing like one, two minutes and we're just keeping it moving. But yeah, keep putting your hand up and please come in again. Uh, Frankie, sorry. Yeah. Any use of drugs will interrupt the process of recovery. In my experience, and it's just based experience, for myself as well as watching other people it's not about judging people it's about observing the things that go on around me most pe people who have the interruption of the process of re recovery is, is a bit like snakes and ladders it's the only way i can say it the amount i remember one guy michael from down in bournemouth who had 10 years and he used to give a guy who was really involved in a fellowship and it was like he was like a babbling newcomer all of a sudden. And that's no disrespect to the newcomers because when you're a newcomer and you come in and you start getting clean, your brain's processing so much that you can't help but overspill and talk and that. And it's quite a common thing in recovery, you know. So any use of drugs interrupting the process of recovery, my experience is going into hospital. And when I came out of hospital, all the members that have been around for quite some time who that are connected with, they used to say two things were really important. One was go on holiday between uh, January to March because you need to have somewhere where you because it's the most stressful period in recovery. And the other thing they used to say was if you go into hospital and have an operation, when you come out, get in deeply involved in the fellowship as possible use as much as the fellowship as possible because we don't know the difference between street drugs and medication that were given. And some of us have to take medication all the time. So there's not a straightforward answer and it's not fair. It isn't fair. Recovery isn't fair, but we do the best we can for ourselves. So yeah, it's like snakes and ladders. Can we have three people to uh, share on that? And the use of drugs interrupt the process of recovery. Their experience, please. Yeah, on the yeah, please three hands on that kind of snakes and ladders concept that Frankie's just talked about, where it's the uh, one minute you're firing on all cylinders, but maybe you've put something else before your recovery, like a relationship you've used, and the next thing your mind's blank, you've forgotten everything you've learned, something like that. Joel, please come in. Uh, cheers, Paul. Thanks, thank you. Uh, for me, it's it was like you said, it's uh, the obsession with females. You know what I mean? It's like I've always put them first. You know, like going on to Facebook and t t texting all the time on Facebook with other women and that. You know, and then that's coming before my recovery, so I've had to cut myself back on that. So for me, that is a drug for me because it's like the obsession. All I'm doing is zooming on the women see what they're up to, you know, and spending more time on the phone looking at that situation instead of putting me recovery first. So I'll leave it there. Cheers. 
before we go on, Frankie, have you got any experience on the kind of the reasons why the two-legged drug is such a good one for us to move in when we put down the narcotics? Have you have you got any thoughts on that? Just straight, it's just straightforward. Your mind and your body and the rest of yourself is just clamoring for the easiest way to fix your feelings. If it's not that, it's a cigarette. If it's not that, it's chocolate. If it's not that, it's gambling. If it's, you know, and all of them are like a, one of them glue mass traps, aren't they, for us? Once we start the process, you know, one is a, one is too many affairs and it's never enough. So, as we just heard Joe confess, and it's not a confession this place, but we just heard Joe confess that once he starts messaging one woman on Facebook, he's often he's like. Hey, you know, Telly Savalis, he's with all his women. You know, he's messaging them all, isn't he? You know, it's like, I can relate, mate. Yeah, I can relate. Brilliant. I can relate. Thank some you. people jump into, uh, see see some of the guys who come over from abroad as soon as they eat the chocolate here. They're walking around with carrier bags of it. Huh? Okay, brilliant, Frankie. Thank you. Right, Sally, two minutes, and then we'll get Sai and then the Jericho boys. Uh, yes, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I could t I actually could totally relate to the um, panicky, anxious newcomer because uh, I'm definitely I'm definitely like that. I just kind of going to go into sharing everything. I, yeah, it just I clearly am overwhelmed about um, and just just talk a lot of shit, really, to be quite honest. Nothing that's really relevant to recovery or how I'm feeling. It's almost like I've got to clear that out of the way. But yeah, I totally relate to that. And and thank you for kind of even raising it because uh, it helps me understand why I do it um, and to be a bit more focused. Um, but just uh, you're talking about, uh, so for me, my reality is um, as uh, this addict takes um, anything to change the way she feels. I, I t will take anything to change the way I feel. Um, and although I, I had already relapsed, I was getting, going back to work and the nervousness and the anxiety around it was just so bad because I didn't have that support network or anybody to speak to. And I was in between sponsors. I just fell short and, and so relapsed because last time I was at work was about two years before that I'd had two years off because of, I went into rehab, you see, and afterwards was focusing on myself and got a great foundation. Well, got a good foundation. Definitely that experience is never wasted. Is it? Um, but yeah, it, it didn't stop me from, um, walking into a pharmacy and doing what I needed to do. And, and, and then it just um, progressed from there. And then a few months later, I got an infection in my little toe. <laughs> like one of the most painful things ever. Um, and I was over the phone speaking to the doctor, pill seeking and saying, I absolutely need a load of codeine or I'm going to, I mean, it was that bad. I, I could have chopped my toe off really. It was a horrible, horrible thing. But um, yeah, I think I think that's what you what you're asking for question wise. I hope that makes sense because right. yeah, I can yeah. babble. Totally, Sally. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Sai, um, period of clean time, and then you've interrupted the process of recovery with a use up. What was that like? Well, for me, um, I'm sorry, I'm an addict. Thanks for hey, everyone tonight uh, hosting and taking part in contribution. Yeah, um, for me, I suppose, the biggest part of mine was uh, not talking about something until it's too painful and it's past it because my part, I'll quote this from the book, is denial is a part of our disease that makes it difficult, if not impossible, for us to acknowledge our reality. In our addiction, denial protected us from seeing the reality of what our lives had become. We often told ourselves that given the right set of circumstances, we might still be able to bring our lives under control. Always skillful at defending our actions, we refused to accept responsibility for the damage done by our addiction. We believed that if we tried long and hard enough, substitute one drug for another, switch friends or change our living arrangements or occupations, our lives are, would improve. These rationalizations repeatedly failed us yet we continued to cling to them. We denied that we had a problem with drugs, regardless of all the evidence to the contrary. We lied to ourselves, believing that we could use again successfully. We justified our actions, despite the wreckage around us resulting from our addiction. The spiritual part of our disease, the part we may recognize only by feeling a feeling of emptiness or loneliness when we first get clean is perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of, our, of addiction for us, because this part of our disease 
It affects us so profoundly and so personally. We may be overwhelmed when we think about applying a program of recovery to it. However, we need to keep in mind that recovery doesn't happen overnight for anyone. Now, I just finished this paragraph. As we start to look at the effects of our disease, we are sure to see that our lives have become unmanageable. We see it in all of the things that we are uh, that is wrong our, that is wrong with our lives. Again, our experiences are individual and vary widely from addict to addict. Some of us realise that our lives have become unmanageable because we felt out of control emotionally or began to feel guilty about our drug use. Some of us have, have lost everything, our homes, our families, our jobs, and our self-respect. Some of us never learned how to function as human beings at all. Some of us have spent times in jails and institutions. Some of us have come very close to death. Whether our individual circumstances, our lives have been governed by obs obsessive, compulsive, self-seeking behavior, and the end result is the unmanageability. But yeah, my, my core of that one was the denial. You know, and it stuck out. Oh, stuck out for you, me. Si, you used up your entire two minutes by reading out That's something. All right. <laughs> it's okay. Well, we're we're going to get you to do a reading later, Si. Well, we'll get Perfect. you to do a reading. This is why we've got the reading up on the screen line by line for us to, but I appreciate the reading. Th thanks for the input. My sponsor says denial is the disease's way of staying anonymous. Uh, Jericho Boys, come in, please. My name's Mark and I'm an addict. Hey, Mark. Hey, man. Hi Paul. Um, before coming into Jericho House, um, I was in another fellowship and I was actively trying to um, progress the process of recovery. Um, I was attending meetings uh, daily, but my, my days were consumed by using morning, noon and night. Um, and I'll be honest, I sometimes even used in meetings. Um, I was practising, uh, sorry, I was uh, reading a the, the basic text in that um, a fellowship and the truth be told I wasn't in any former uh, recovery program uh, and my days were just um, consumed with, with, with using and, and I couldn't I couldn't um, get anywhere with that program and to be honest I had to take myself completely out of the community um, and come into Jericho House in order to get that um, or to, to even start my process of recovery. Um, but I, I just want to come in and share that. Leave it there. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, the one I have for denial, Paul, is don't even notice I am lying. Because that one really worked for me. Because it's hard to tell, isn't it, with denial? Oh, yeah. You need, you need a sponsor. You need people in recovery to say... Really? Did you hear what you just said? You know, you need you need support. So, mm. yeah, let's uh, get someone to uh, read the next paragraph, one five three to one five seven. Ryan, you want to do that reading? One five three to one five seven. You got your hand up. Yeah, I was going to show on the denial, but... Um, we, were, we weren't even... I don't think we were even on denial. I think we kind of went a bit... Oh, is it? Over the <laughs> denial thing. So if we could, That's if all right. Know, man. If we could do 153 to 157, that'd be great. 153. Right. We all find that the feeling we get from helping others motivates us to do better in our own lives. So we keep what we have by giving it away. 154. If we are hurting... And most of us, hang on, let me make this bigger. If we are hurting, and most of us do from time to time, we learn to ask for help. 155. We find that pain shared is pain lessened. Yeah, sharing is caring. 156. Members of the fellowship are willing to help a relapser recover and have insight and useful suggestions to offer when asked. 157. Recovery found in Narcotics Anonymous must come from within, and no one stays clean for anyone but themselves. That's really good, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, the whole of that paragraph is solution, isn't it? The whole of it is positive. The whole of it tells you the actions of what you need to do, where everything else is pointing out diseases, alienation, and so on. This is mainly this paragraph is like 
you know, if we are hurting, as most of us do from time to time, we learn to ask for help. So we have to learn, isn't it? Asking for help. We're one of the only fellowships where we have to get off our own ass and ask people to help us. You go to other fellowships and they're a bit like the living dead. The minute you walk in the room, they're like staggering up to you, isn't they? Like going, here, here's the book. Here's the big book for you to read. And I don't mean AA. I'm not picking on them. But I'm saying that's my experience. And I see that happen in NA sometimes. And I've seen newcomers exit out the room because they're being crowded for fuck's sake. Try smoking crack for a year and then come into an NA meeting, you know? So... But, uh, Paul, do you want to pick the question? Okay, if I must. Uh, one, five, six. So members of the fellowship are willing to help a relapse or recover and have, it, and have insight and useful suggestions. What's a good suggestion? Well, that's not what I was going to say, but if you, if you want to go down that road, what's a good suggestion? Yeah. Let's, let's start that. No, the, the, yeah, you, you know I was way overcomplicate this and ask and get, go a lot deeper. But, yeah, let's, let's stick with your frivolous what's a good suggestion question. I'm joking. I'm joking, right, Jericho boys, give us the best suggestion you guys have had, apart from coming to the fortress of NA, of course, but within here, what's the best suggestion that you could share with a newcomer who's here tonight? Hi, how are you doing? I'm Sean, I'm an addict. Uh, thanks, Paul, thanks, Frankie, for taking the workshop. Um, well, the main, that, that uh, question you just read, it uh, took me back to the just for today, and it's encouragement to the um, and every time that I've relapsed, um, I, I was already in a group and, you know, that, that stood me in good stead because my fellow group members, any time they knew it, they kind of knew me well when I was a serial relapser, they would always phone up, um, just say, listen, they, they would never say, you need to do this, you need to do that, but they would say, like, come on, I'll take you at a meeting, um, you should start picking up your phone before you pick up the first. You need to start sharing your thinking. Um, and that was mainly where I was going wrong. I would stop doing meetings and stuff, you know. So it's all the things that I was, I knew that were keeping me well that I just stopped doing. It was like a, a built-in resistance, a mental blocker. And then when that obsession was in, that, that, that thought of the first drink or the, the first whatever, you know, I was just, I was away and running when I, when I should have been doing that stuff. Um, a, a big one they were telling me as well, stay away from pubs, clubs, and people that I used to use with. And that was probably the biggest thing that I, I struggled with, to be honest. Um, letting go of so-called old friends, you know, and... Staying away from high risk areas like the scheme I grew up in and stuff. Um, and it was funny, I was actually just after the juice for today, uh, I shared back on that uh, about the encouragement. And then I read this page, so it's, it's quite um, remarkable that it came up with the, the, this book really comes alive. But I'll, I'll just leave it there, guys. Cheers. Thanks, Sean. That was great. Um, right, hang on a second. Right, let's see. I was waiting to say, guys that haven't shared before, put your hands up, please. But that's great. Uh, Jericho girls, when you come, thanks, Paul. It's Moira again. Um, I just a quick one for that is a good suggestion for me was connection. Um, staying connected to people, do you know, just making sure that you're, you're around people in any in any around people in recovery, picking up the phone. I was really bad at picking up the phone. Um, when I was connected and going to meetings and speaking to people, things went well. Um, and when I wasn't connected, it inevitably relapsed. So that that, that was one that worked for me. Thanks. Connection, brilliant. Um, Vicky. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for your service. My name's Vicky. I'm a grateful recovering addict today. Um, I've got two, right? And it's the two that have served me really, really well. Uh, Self-care is the first one. Um, so I came out of treatment four and a half months clean in 2019 and I was like a bullet out of a gun. I just took all the suggestions. Um, as soon as I, I had the clean time, I took service at h and I. I was covering two treatment centres instead of one because one, one was going to not be serviced if somebody didn't cover it and it was female. So I was doing two nights a week instead of one. I was, I was doing the secretarial position when we didn't have a secretary. I was meeting newcomers every day. I was just bang, bang, bang. And 
the inside job really, really started to pay off, you know, and I can't, I can't say it didn't. The rate of growth I had was phenomenal, as well as, well as working the steps, obviously. Um, but I did uh, 17 months clean, I wakened up sideways on the bathroom floor, which was a bit of a novelty clean, and it was blood pressure and stress. Um, so I absolutely had to just take it down a notch and start prioritising stuff um, and self-care. And then my sponsor had been saying it to me for months. You're doing too much. You need to self-care. And I thought that that stuff was self-care. You know, I didn't understand that self-care is sometimes meditation and prayer and spending a bit of time on my own. Um, oh, but, but like I say, it served me well. Um, sorry, Paul. I'm saying it's sometimes hard to find a balance, isn't it? Yeah, it really was. Um, but I learned, you know, I learned. Um, I learned well. I was taught well uh, how, how to balance, and I'm a bit better at it now. Um, the other one was um, right through the steps, Vicky, or two years clean before you get in a romantic relationship. And it absolutely served me beautifully. Served me beautifully well. Um, if I'm honest, I would probably, for a long time, I was saying I'm reclaiming my dignity as a woman, which my addiction took from me, stripped from me. When I worked four and five, I saw that I had a lot of fear there. There was a lot of fear there. Um, what, like body dysmorphia, self-centered, uh, self-consciousness, self right? There was a lot of that stuff going on. Um, but also there was a quite a stiff middle-class Christian background um, and a perfectionism around that stuff, which had only left me because I was using for so long. So, but again, um, that stuff served me well. It really, really served me well. Um, I just didn't get caught up. I didn't get caught up. And I saw a lot of people going out the door on that stuff, uh, jumping into relationships as soon as they were out of rehab with no step work under their belt. And I just listened to my sponsor. It suited me to listen. Um, so those were the two, self-care and uh, a bit of recovery about you before you jump into a romantic relationship. Those two have served me well. I'm two, two years and nine months clean. Thanks oh, for letting me Vicky. Yeah, lovely to hear you. Great. Um, I think it's Jericho. Um, Ryan, I'm not ignoring you. I just want to get some people in that we haven't had before. Uh, is it Jericho, girls? And Marie, do it again. Uh, just quickly, um, the best two things I get told when I very first went to Narcotics Anonymous was you don't have to be clean to come to meetings and to keep coming back. Yeah. That's people. Yeah. 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 How long did we do that for Frankie coming to any meetings using? And Well, I was only 10 years. Yeah. I think uh, yours was a bit longer than mine, but it's not a competition of... Uh, uh, no, but it's really important, isn't it, to stress that if you do, I was talking to someone, a newcomer about this the other day, if you do, unfortunately, if you end up using and going back, back out, the important thing is to know that this is the place when you're ready for the, you know, to, to, to try again. And just to share briefly, what my, my swift remark about not having a, a very good reception when I came to NA, it's also part perspective because I came in totally uh rinsed out and a bit like yourself Paul I came in showing my illness off to people you know and I was very in a bad state as well health wise and I had a very big mouth and uh what I realized was uh, people I pushed them away so when I'm in physical meetings now and I see a, a little wanker like I was in the meeting who's got a big mouth, who's obviously wants recovery, but doesn't know how to express it. I try to go over and help, mm -hmm. but I try and treat them like how I should have been treated. And that's not, I don't want to kill them with love because we can kill people with love in NA. We can love them so much that they just keep relapsing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to be the parent, don't you? And say, uh, yeah, see you at the meeting, mate. Don't phone me anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, jo, please come in. Hi, I'm Jo, I'm still an addict. Hey, um, so the biggest one for me um, was 90 meetings in 90 days and committing to that. Um, and it's everything we've been talking about the night, you know, making the connections, getting involved. Um, and when people see you come in and hearing it every day, you know, whether it's two or three meetings a day, just hearing the same stuff every day, I had to hear it repetitively. And just learning, just soaking it all up every day. And, and when people see you coming about, 
you know, the hand comes out, Mayor, you're invited to coffee after the meetings and uh, you just get involved in so much. And I think it, it worked so well for me. The day I finished mine, I just started another one the next game day because it, it, it rose my self-esteem so much. Aye, so that's been the best one for me. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Joe. And Mr G? Oh, hey, yeah, this is, um, I guess that was a, a Zoom default. Uh, I'm Ryan, I'm at it. Ryan? Yeah, uh, good so, good, yeah, thanks Thanks for having me. Um, I, I agree with all of the, the things that were said, the 90 and 90 and person, places and things. Uh, two things that my sponsor said to me was, uh, one, uh, where are your feet? <laughs> so to keep me in the present um, and uh, keep me not worrying about the past or future. Then the other thing was, um, you know, it, he brought up it was a bad time in life when I didn't have the drugs and I didn't have the solution. Um, so when I came in and was clean, um, but didn't have the, the drugs to deal with all of my other problems, I still needed a solution. Uh, so it was a good, uh, a good saying to not put off getting into the work uh, and doing, doing the 12 steps and doing the work to find a real solution. Thanks. Pass. Lovely, Ryan. Thank you so much for sharing. Paul, did you have a, another question to throw in or did we want to it's, do another? I was, uh, let's have a look. What I was really interested in, uh, no, I think we've kind of done it. I wanted to touch on the unconditional love stuff, but I think we've kind of moved past that. It was this kind of idea of, you know, the our, it says, you know, at the foot of our symbol, the, the goodwill at the bottom, and it says the purest expression of goodwill is our desire for the newcomer to find the freedom that we've had and something that's always astounded me is that the hand's always been extended every time I've come back over and over again. And I think that's the what I think that's the life force of this this program and an equal service. But maybe that was more of a comment. Maybe we could move on to the last. We're we're moving into the last kind of 15 minutes. So maybe we just uh we deal with the last uh part, the last 158 to 162 if you want. And that would probably take us up to the end and then we can look at something else the next time. Sure. Um, we need a reader then. We need someone to, uh, is there anyone, any one of the, uh, oh, hi there. Oh, I can't see your name because it's- Rhonda. Oh, hi Rhonda, good to see you. Let's get you unmuted. Please read those last five lines for us, will you? Yes, my name is Rhonda and I'm Julian Attic. Hi Rhonda. Hi. In our disease, we are dealing with a destructive, violent power greater than ourselves that can lead to relapse. If we have relapsed, it is important to keep in mind that we must get back to meetings as soon as possible. Otherwise, we may have only months, days, or hours before we reach a threshold where we are gone beyond recall. Our disease is so cunning that it can get us into impossible situations. When it does, we come back to the program if we can, while we can. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Rhonda. And Joe, can you look up Impossible for us? Or anyone you fancy, but I think Impossible is the one. Where were we? Um, our disease is so cunning that it can get us into impossible situations, okay. That's phoning my ex-girlfriend, that one. among other things. <laughs> okay, Paul Cummins, you've got to give us a question. Oh, is it me? I thought we were waiting for Joe to look up Impossible. Well, let me think. No, she's doing that as well. But Okay, all right. Sorry, I didn't know we're, we're not, all... We're not like yeah, Roseman. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> impossible. Not able to occur, exist, or be done. Um, absurd, futile, hopeless, impassable, and impractical. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Joe. This this idea of our disease is so cunning and it talks about it being baffling as well. And Rhonda, I'd love your input on this. You know, maybe an example of, you know, we've put down the drugs. What does the disease look like when it's being very, very cunning? Let's unmute you if you Fox just do, cunning. Just do the hot potato thing and throw it on Rhonda. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm relapsed enough to kind of recognize the patterns so there's a pattern i put down the drug and then it's usually a man food 
tele binge watching TV, shopping, not always in the same order, but it always happens that way. Yeah, thanks, Rhonda. Thank Brian, you. cunning. Cunning? I suppose that's like the people pleasing side of it, isn't it? Um, okay. You know, that's the connections as well. Um, you know, I try to keep everybody happy. Um, it's not easy to do that, really. Um, I think it's important that we do what's right for our, for our recovery, um, no matter what, because we need to stay clean. Um, you know, but connection is very important. And, um, you know, I do have connections. <laughs> you know, I do speak, I have got numbers and I do speak, I have, you know, I've got friends in the fellowship, but, you know, I know we all got our own problems and, um, you know, I need to remember that everyone's got their own lives as well. Um, so I just stay focused on my recovery and by doing so, you know, that's, that's my kids and, and you know, that's fixing the damage this, this disease has caused. And, um, you know, I won't rest until I, I've done my job, you know. And I've, right. you know thank is, you very much. It is so cunning, though. For me, it's like the internal, it's like the internal dialogue. You know, can I shut off the internal dialogue? You know, it's, it's just, you know, that's the maybe, the, can I shut off? Can I stop the self-importance? You know, can I still be of service? Uh, Marla, please come in. Hi, Marla Attic. And this uh, cunning, when I was new in recovery the first time, one of the things that I realized, you know, was the way I had to treat the disease was like a person who was very intelligent with an agenda would make a plan and set out traps. And that just kind of, you know, because there'd be different things that would happen in life and, and also, you know, things would show up in my own mind and things. And you know, it's like something would show up in my mind and is this like, is this part of the agenda of the disease or is this something useful and helpful? So I just start becoming mindful of what was going on in my own mind, you know, and, and sort of uh, yeah. house cleaning a little bit, you know, even before I got involved in the step work, which is the major house cleaning. So that's what cunning means to me. I had to treat it like an intelligent person that was going to set out traps for me, you know, just over and over and over in different ways. And it's patient. And it would wait for a while, you know, and it'd be like smooth sailing. And then all of a sudden, uh-huh, here it is again, suddenly, you know, so it was like that. Yeah, brilliant, Marla. And, and maybe just because we're coming into the final, you know, this and uh, this violent, this destructive, violent power, one of the, the manifestations of my disease is telling me that I'm all right. You know, I'm actually fine and you lot are sick and I'm not sick and I'm actually smarter than you and I've got this going on and got that going on. And that is how the disease manifests itself. Most of telling me I haven't got I think it. Richie I'll... had his hand up. I know I was going to get Richie. Yeah, yeah, I was going to get a me. And uh, yeah, this destructive, violent power. I like this emotive language because it's it kind of reminds me of what I've got. Uh, Richie, can you Matt? Can you get Richie either on the violent destruct the destructive, violent power, Richie, or the cunning? Richie, an addict. Hey, Richie. I was going to stick with the cunning, like, just because yeah. uh, it's a bit relevant in the fact that I think I wrote about it in one of the questions in my step three, like just yesterday. It, it was about the cunningness of the disease, where I find a lot nowadays it's very good at disguising itself as a spiritual principle. Uh, and that, what I mean by that is that I can think I'm doing a kind of good deed or a good action, and then I realise I've got an ulterior motive there. I've done it for me and not for helping the person that I've actually thought I'm helping. And that seems to be where my kind of disease is at quite a, not a lot just now, but that's where I'm becoming more aware of it. Um, and it was something my, kind of, my last sponsor kind of did point out to me, and, I, and that's why I think I kind of realised that he spoke about it and said to watch for it disguising itself. Um, and, and yeah, I definitely can see that happening quite a lot. Um, the destructiveness and violent power greater than ourselves. I mean, yeah, anything about a disease is destructive, not just to me, to anyone around me. I mean, it's in the past, it did destroy everything. Um, there's nothing nice about it. It is violent. 
because it hits you very quickly. I, I know that myself, like um, through my own vast experience, as soon as I've been off that right track, it, it's quite violent how it, it breaks me spiritually. You know what I mean, um, and it will destroy and break me down quite quickly. And then the roll-on effect for that is I will destroy and be quite violent towards other people. Um, not wanting to, because it's a power greater than me, and it becomes unmanageable, and it happens without me wanting to do it. So, yeah. Um, Thanks, Richie. Uh, right. you, just you. you just triggered one for me, if I can quickly share. I got into that early days thing where uh, one addict helping another is without parallel. The girl I was dating in NA was around the same clean time. She was seven months. So one addict helping another. Uh, I went around to her house. She was having a drink that I didn't know she was having a drink. I got so angry around this kind of like, I say the spiritual kind of relapse as such. I got so angry. I stole money off her and went and used. And I justified all of that. And I had no shame about losing seven months. I had no shame. I think the most important thing when I got my mind right about recovery was knowing how hard it is to get clean time and come back. When you've relapsed enough and you start to understand, it's not that you have to relapse, but if you do, when you realize how difficult it is to get a day clean, you have to have respect for someone who comes in the rooms who has a day clean. You have to. But you know how hard it is to get clean. You know, it's one of the hardest things. But to just throw it away like that and to cause harm and everything else. And that's another ball game making amends to ex-girlfriends. You have to hand that over to a sponsor. You can't make that decision for yourself, even though it's something I always wanted to do. But uh, thanks for that, Richie. <laughs> kicking that off for me. Paul? I think we're in the uh, the final. Oh, did you read that? Sorry, Joe's put it up in the in the chat. Did you read that? No. Oh no, I don't know what you're to what you're. Oh no, uh, she sent it to me. Thanks, Joe. Cunning, having skill in achieving one's ends by deceit or evasion. Ah. I know what my my. Uh, Achieving one as ends, I know what mine were. You know, one addict helping another. That's a dangerous one, especially when you come out of rehab. Yeah. You might have to think a bit linear with that one. Yeah. But we're in safe company here, I think. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, I think we all identify with that. I'm all pretty much. Um, <laughs> it's, uh... And what Rhonda's just making a comment there. I was just going to say, because we've got, well, we've got a couple of minutes. Social acceptability is a disguise also, Rhonda. Thank you so much for that comment as well. Um, do we have time to do a, a, like a, a wrapping, a wrapping of up? Three minutes. Of course. Do you want... Well, we've got Ike. We haven't heard from Ike, have we? He's normally here. Ike, you've been here the whole time. Uh, do you have any kind of overview or feedback or comments? I think Ike's maybe driving. I don't. He's want driving, to probably. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to get Nikolai. Nikolai or Tiffany, you guys haven't talked tonight. Nikolai, I'm unmuting you to to. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Nikolai addict. No, I just I appreciate everything. That's I love this. I love this format. Um, in terms of cunning and uh, uh, yeah, no, just that's that's the nature of my addiction. It does anything to get whatever it wants, and it doesn't matter who's in front of it or what's getting in the way or what's good for me or anybody else. Um, and I also just, I also wanted to say real quick, I had a year clean last Tuesday, and this the whole East Coast Scotland area has been really crucial in helping me stay clean. So. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you for this meeting. Amazing, Nikolai. So happy to hear that. Thanks. So it's great to be on this journey with you. Um, Tiffany, would you like to say something? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Tiffany. I'm an addict. Um, I guess what I'd like to say is like, uh, 
the one addict helping another is without parallel. Um, it made me think of, you know, my own thinking and what I know about my own thinking is that it got me exactly to where I am today, you know, sitting in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous, not knowing how to live my life. Um, and so like my expectation of NA before I become a member was, you know, how in the world are a bunch of junkies going to show me how to live a better life? And the thing is, is like those junkies know exactly where I came from and to sit there and for them to be happy with their lives today, like, of course, they would be able to help me, you know, and that's without parallel because the normies, as we like to call them, um, they don't understand. Um, I couldn't reach out to them and be like, you know, I'm feeling some type of way and um, it's blown out of proportion and not have them look at me funny, which has happened a lot for me. Um, so like, I, you know, like I truly subscribe to that, you know, it's without parallel and, uh, my, my, um, fellow NA members really have saved my life and, uh, I'm eternally grateful for that. Thanks. Tiffany, thank you. Victoria, and uh, sorry, I didn't mean to miss you out. Would you like to, anything you'd like to say, feedback? I don't think we've heard from you tonight, have we? Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Victoria, an addict. Hi, Victoria. I'm, I'm just really enjoying listening tonight. I'm very, very hey. tired today. And that's always a, a time where it's probably not good to open my mouth. <laughs> Lovely. So thanks Lovely. very much for hosting this. It's the first time I've come and it's great. Thank you. Oh, Thank just, you. On, just on that point, Victoria, we've got, uh, for anyone that's not on the East Coast Scotland WhatsApp group, we do post nightly or daily meetings on a WhatsApp group. If you're not on it, send me your number and I'll get you added. Uh, Frankie, can I just do one last thing? Because Barry... Oh. Barry is five days, five, right, Barry? Five days clean, first time at any. I would just love to hear his takeaways or perspective on what we've done tonight. Is it, is it sending you running for the hills, Barry, or otherwise? No, uh, six days today, Paul. Six um, days, sorry. Which is, which is probably the longest in about two years, which is, uh, which is good progress. Um, I've got to say, I mean, probably can't tell from the look of me, but I'm a bit of a geek about things anyway. Uh, and of the few meetings I've been to four now, two have been this format and I've found them incredibly useful. I found all the meetings useful, but these incredibly useful in terms of actually getting to understand the text that I've just sort of started reading and immersing myself in, hearing people's perspectives and experience based on that text. So, uh, no, I've getting get a lot of this format of meetings and uh, thanks everyone for, for sharing and for, for the welcome. It's, uh, it's been really fantastic. Great, Barry. Lovely to see you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you for everyone staying. Stickers and stayers, stayers and stickers. Stick with the winners or win with the stickers. <laughs> yeah. How you doing, Paul? Okay. Well, I think we'll do uh, just for today. Thank you, everyone, for the for an amazing workshop again. Um, and I think we'll do the just for today. I think it's great, and we'll be doing it again. We were a week late this month because frankie was on holiday so we'll be this will only be a three week wait i think until the next one so first monday of every month we do this but this meeting meets every monday anyway we just change up the format so what we need to do is the just for today do you have that one matt to hand by any chance no okay um let me bear with me a sec and um, if you could unmute the jericho boys let me see. I don't even know if I've got it here. I will have that. But yeah. There you go. I had it there. Sorry. It went again. There we go. You see that? Yep. Hey, hi, I'm Darren. I'm an addict. Hi, Darren. Hi. Just for today, tell yourself. Just for today. My thoughts are on my recovery, living and enjoying life without the use of drugs. Just for today. I will have faith in someone and any who believes in me and wants to help me in my recovery. Just for today. I will have a program. I will try to follow it to the best of my ability. Just for today. Through NA, I will try to get a better perspective on my life. Just for today. I will be unafraid. My thoughts are going up. My new associations people are not using and who have found a new way of life. So long as I follow that way, I have nothing to do with that. Yeah. Thanks, boys. And I think it would be great if Nikolai, with his uh, 12 months glow in the dark, let me change the setting so everyone can unmute. And then 
Nikolai, if you would be good enough to close yeah. the meeting with the serenity prayer. Yeah, my name's Nikolai, I'm an addict. <clears throat> if we could have a m moment of silence for the addict suffering inside and outside. God. 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 Serenity. To accept things I cannot change. God, things I can. The wisdom of the difference. Coming back. Go Jericho, girls. Thank you very much.